We are in the middle of a series where we're taking our time going through the fruit of the Spirit. And so we have done love, joy, peace, and today, patience. So I thought the only appropriate way to get this started, we're going to do a little crowd participation. We're going to get you active involved. I want to get a pulse on where we are when it comes to our patience. So everyone's going to start with their hand raised, and I'm going to say something. And if you have done or participated in that thing, you keep your hand raised. If, you, if it does not apply to you, you put your hand down. So everyone raise your hand. And if what I say does not apply to you, put your hand down. So keep it up if it does. All right, first of all, uh, how many of you have sped on the road? So keep your hands up if you have. So if anyone put their hand down, you're a liar. You need Jesus. <laughs> all right, so keep your hand raised. Uh, what about burning the roof of your mouth with a piece of pizza? I think everyone here has done that. Okay, there's still a lot of people raising their hands. What about this one? Uh, Amazon Prime. How many of you have ordered something and it's delayed and instead of being delivered in two days, it takes longer than two days and you're upset? Okay, we got a few people that are lost. Okay, what about this one? How many of you have been in the grocery store, you choose a line and then immediately say, I need to go to a different line and change lines in the grocery store? Anyone? That's a lot of you, okay? Uh, what about this? Uh, you intentionally do not choose to watch a TV show because they do not offer the full season at once. I know there used to be a time where it released episodes. Okay, so you, everyone can put their hands down. I think we have a patience problem. That's my whole point. So when we look at the scriptures, here's what Galatians 5 says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things... There is no law. And so if, if you're like me, which I know you are because I got to see your hands, we struggle with patience. We tend to be irritable, impatient. Uh, we want things quick, immediate, in the now. So let's break this down. The word that Paul uses here for patience is uh, this Greek word, makothumia, and it's a compound word of two words, makros and thymos, which is long Passion. So if you want to literally translate this word, you can translate it long anger. And this is what the connotation of this means. The idea of waiting sufficient time before expressing your anger. Now, some of you in the room are like, my, my fuse is very short. I am short to anger. I, it does not take a lot to set you off and to get you angry and upset and to get your passion overwhelming and overflowing. And if Patience is waiting a sufficient time to become and express anger. This brings up something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, the anger of God. For many people in our world, in our society and culture, the anger of God is one of the primary reasons they choose to not give their life to the Lord and to serve his church. Because for those people, they cannot reconcile in their minds the God of the Old Testament being angry, vindictive, judgment, with Jesus in the New Testament who's loving, calm, patient, and peaceful. And if we're honest, they kind of have a point to their argument because you read the Old Testament and you read these words. The Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Now that's, that's pretty bold. Like dead bodies in the street because of God's anger. Now what I want to do this morning is I want to take a closer look at the anger of God because I believe this directly relates and connects to the patience of God. And I believe by the end, we're going to see how this is extremely good news for us this morning. Okay, to get started, let's just talk about anger. When we talk about our human anger, we tend to talk about our experience and our expression of anger. And for most of us, it's a human emotion that we all feel and express. And for most of us, we understand that there's two types of anger. There is anger as protection. 
So you have a child, someone you care about, they're threatened and you get angry and you want to protect them. That is like the good anger. And then there's the other type of anger, which is anger as abusive. And sadly and tragically, many of us in this room have been on the receiving end of other people's anger that has hurt them, betrayed them, and wounded them. And I also know that in this room, on the other side, there's some of us that have actively, intentionally, or unintentionally hurt others that we love with our anger. Is this the anger that God talks about? An uncontrollable, destructive, often hurtful kind of anger? The problem is when we talk about the attributes of God and describe God's character, often we begin with our personal experience with that emotion and then we say, okay, if this is how I feel anger, if this is how I experience anger, then this must be how God uh, deals with anger as well. And so we take our idea and we translate that and put that onto God himself. And many of us, if we're honest, many of us think of God as being angry as uh, being volatile, who dispenses wrath, if you do not follow his rules. But the reality is, when you read the scriptures, God gets angry at primarily three things. First, at human violence. Second, leaders who oppress or abuse others. And thirdly, he gets angry, and this is the most the thing he gets angry the most at, Israel's constant covenant betrayal. Abraham Heschel is a, a scholar and theologian. He says it this way. The prophets never portray God's anger as something that cannot be accounted for, unpredictable, irrational. It is never a spontaneous outburst, but a reaction occasioned by the conduct of of humans and motivated by concern for right and wrong. To put it another way, the Bible Project in their huge video on anger says, God's anger is his just and measured response to the covenant betrayal of his own people. It is not a volatile or unpredictable explosion of abusive violence. So here's what I want you to know from the jump. Yes, God does get angry. But I would imagine that at the end of this morning, the way that you think of his anger might change. So, how does God himself describe his anger? Exodus 34. And he, God, passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The main thing we need to understand about the anger of God is that it is slow. It is slow. And we can trace this theme of God being slow to anger throughout the whole story of the scriptures. Do you know who the first person God gets angry with in the scriptures? Where his anger first appears? I think the answer might surprise you. 54 chapters in, which is pretty far into the story to get angry, and he gets angry at Moses. Here's the story. Exodus chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. God is wanting Moses to go to Pharaoh and deliver his people, and Moses is refusing. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger 
burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. So this is an interesting story about God's anger. And two observations. One, this is the fifth objection Moses is making to God to get to not follow his, his ways. So God does not get angry with him the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time. It takes him five times of rejecting God for him to finally get upset. And then second, God's anger does not lead to punishment or violence. Did you pay attention? He actually grants Moses' request. The last time that God's anger shows up in Exodus is with the golden calf, where his people have betrayed him. And even in that story, Moses reminds God of who he is and who he said he would be, and God relents from his anger and continues to provide for the people. This is the constant story between God and his people, that we provoke his anger, and his response is to be slow to anger. Adam and Eve disobeyed the one rule, and God in his kindness and his mercy was slow to become angry and covered their shame and nakedness and removed them from the Garden of Eden. And it says in the scriptures, because he did not want them to eat from the tree of life and make this permanent, and that he would send someone through their line to come rescue and save them. You look at Abraham. Abraham and his wife are traveling to this land. They come to a city, and Abraham is scared and says that his wife is actually his sister and gives his wife to this man and come to find out, he's like, oh, that's your wife. Have her back. I do not want to be in trouble. And then later, they come up with a brilliant idea to, to have Abraham sleep with their servant, to have a child, and yet God is slow to anger and kind and patient with them. Pharaoh is enslaving God's people. And instead of just coming down with his wrath like a swift hammer, and his kindness and patience is slow to be angry and gives Pharaoh 10 opportunities to change his mind before he comes in. Israel, they get delivered from Pharaoh, and for 40 years they complain and grumble about the food they're eating and the drink that they're having, and yet God is slow to anger and for 40 years provides them nourishment. This is the story of the scriptures. Now, I want to take time out. Depending on what family you were raised in and what kind of church, if you did grow up in church you went to, you might need to hear one of two things. My guess is if you grew up in a conservative church with a religious environment, maybe this morning you need to hear that God is slow to anger. That he is slow to become angry. Maybe you think that God is just waiting for you to mess it up so he can punish you and give you what you deserve. Maybe you grew up outside the church and for you, it's, you just can't get your act together. You don't behave properly. You are constantly disappointing your parents and those around you. And so you try to do better and you try to do better, but you keep failing and keep failing and keep disappointing. I wanna tell you this morning, God is slow to anger. He is patient. Perhaps some of you in this room need to hear something else. God is slow to anger. Maybe you aren't following Jesus and you believe in the ideology of tolerance and individualism, that you can do what you want, when you want, how you want. No one can tell you differently. And God for you is like a permissive parent. Did anyone have those parents in high school that, like, their friends in high school, yeah, you can come over and drink at our house? You know, that permissive parent that lets them do whatever they want. And for you, that's how you see God, as this permissive parent that kind of lets you do whatever you want with no consequences. He just wants you to be happy. I want to tell you, God is not a permissive parent, but he's also not an angry jerk of a father. He is a good father that is compassionate, gracious, and slow to anger. And like a good father, 
he gets angry because of his love. His love compels him to be angry. And if you struggle and wrestle with the idea of God being angry, I would just submit to you, if God wasn't angry, that would be a problem. Could you imagine if someone that you know doesn't get angry when they see injustice in the world? That doesn't get angry when they see kids get hurt? That doesn't get angry for whatever you can fill in the blank, like his love compels him to anger. Which brings up the million dollar question of the morning. Why is God patient? Why is God slow to anger? Second Peter 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So why is God patient? God is patient because he does not want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. So the reason that he's patient with you, when you don't deserve it, when you fail and mess up and make mistakes, it's because he wants you to have life. I hope after going through the scriptures you, we can logically conclude that you cannot seriously study the scriptures and come to the conclusion that God is a malevolent, angry, out to get you, punish you, God. He is patient and slow to anger. Depending on what translation you have, uh, instead of patience, your translation might say forbearance. The fruit of spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. And that word is really interesting, if you have that translation, forbearance. Uh, most of us know that word forbearance when it comes to mortgages or our student loan payments. And uh, hopefully you've never been in this situation, but for those of you that don't know, forbearance is the action of refraining from exercising a legal right, especially enforcing the payment of a debt. So if you're one of millions of people in the country that have overwhelming student loan debt, you can get your loans to be in forbearance where you agree with the other person for a short period of time to delay payments and you get some time to figure some things out. Now, here's what I want you to know. God and you, you have a debt with God. You owe him. And the reason why you're indebted to God is because we believe in a God that is perfect and holy. And so the moment you're not perfect, you have failed. And whether you intentionally do things or unintentionally do things, you are constantly adding to the debt that you owe God. And the good news is that Jesus does not bring forbearance but he brings forgiveness of our sins. Forbearance is delaying your sin and debt, but forgiveness is defeating and delivering you from your sin and debt. The conversation that Jesus had with his father was like, hey God, like, uh, I, I, know you, hey, um, I know you created them, and I know they kind of mess up, and they, they're just kind of dumb, and they do things they shouldn't, and you know, like, maybe, like maybe dad, if you could just agree to refrain from exercising your legal right and destroy them and give them what they deserve? Could you, like, I don't know, maybe, could you give them a little bit more time? Could you delay their punishment? Because I really thank God that if you give them more time, 
they will figure it out. If you give them more time, they'll come up with some things to convince you that you should love them. You know what, God, I, if you give them a little more time, they have this thing called AI. I think if you give them a few more years, they'll finally figure it out. You know, next month is an election, God. If you give them a few more weeks, they'll really figure it out this election, and then they'll finally be perfect. No, that is not the conversation Jesus had with his father. Romans 10 says that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Romans 8 says that on the cross, Jesus condemned sin in his flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in you. So for those that believe in Jesus and profess with their mouth that he is Lord, when God looks at the balance sheet of your life written across that page and the blood of the lamb is paid in full, you no longer have a debt. And it is not by your effort and striving. The anger of God that was directed and aimed that you deserved because you have offended a holy and perfect God has not been directed towards you, but towards his son. And that on that cross, he paid your debt, he received the penalty so that you might be the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And let me tell you something. The only reason this is available to anyone who professes with their mouth that Jesus is Lord is because God is patient. He didn't have to. You want to talk about what we deserve, what's fair? The Lord's patience means your salvation. And if you're in this room, and if you do not follow Jesus, if you're confused, if you're angry, if you don't know where to stand, I want to talk to you for a second. You might be wanting evidence that God is real, that God is who he says he is before you give your life to him. The fact that you have breath in your lungs and a heartbeat in your chest is evidence of his patience towards you, of his kindness towards you. He has not given you what you deserve. And the only reason he's patient with you is because he wants you to come home. Augustine is one of the most famous theologians that ever lived. A lot of our work is based off of him. And I want to share a story from his life. Uh, his mom, Monica, is a saint in the Catholic Church. She's a saint of moms, but also the saint of patients uh, because of the story. Augustine grew up, and uh, his mom, Monica, was given into marriage to this man who was a pagan, did not believe in Christ. And... Monica's husband ends up being not kind to her, makes fun of her and her relationship with Jesus, and yet she just determines, I'm going to pray. And I will develop this life of prayer. And her husband is abusive towards her, has an affair with her, and this whole time she is on her knees, fervent in prayer. They end up having children, and their firstborn is Augustine, who's now one of the most famous Christians that ever lived. And a few years later, her husband comes to faith and credits it to the prayers of Monica, his wife. And now their son, Augustine, is older and he leaves the house and he rebels from the faith that he grew up in. And he is living a wild life. He is promiscuous with women, seeking pleasure, doing anything he wants, chasing pleasure and satisfaction. And in his mom, Monica, is praying for her son all day all night. It gets to the point where it seems like it's hopeless. So Monica goes to the local bishop and says, hey, can you speak to my son and convince him that the life he's living is not going to lead to the path that is good for him? 
But Augustine was one of the most brilliant people that ever lived, and he had a reputation for being smart. He taught rhetoric at the age of 15, so this bishop was like, yeah, I'm not going to get in a conversation with him. And yet Monica persisted and persisted and persisted. Eventually, he was so annoyed with her persistence that he answered her, go, go, leave me alone. Continue what you are doing. It is not possible that the son of so many prayers and tears should be lost. A short while after that, Augustine leaves without telling his mom and goes to Rome. She finds out, Chase, she makes her way to Rome. Before she can get to Rome, Augustine finds out that she's on the way, so he sneaks out and goes to Milan. She finds out and just keeps chasing down, pursuing him, praying for him. It's in Milan. After 17 years later, Augustine comes to faith. And when Augustine is writing and reflecting on this, he talks about his baptism and how his mom was there. And his mom said, there was only one reason and one reason alone why I wish to remain a little longer in this life. And it was to see you become a Christian. Later in his life, he said this, my mother gave birth to me twice. The second time, required a lengthy spiritual travail of prayer and tears. But it was crowned at last with the joy of seeing me not only embrace the faith and receive baptism, but also dedicating my life without reserve to the service of Christ. What I want us to do, the take home, the application, I want us to engage in what some people refer to laboring prayer, the kind of prayer that gives birth to new life. And when I look around this room, I know some of your stories. Some of you in this room are the answer to other people's prayers. And some of you are like Monica. You have kids. You have family members. And they are rebelling rejecting, and you have been praying and praying and praying for them. And I understand that there's two end results from those prayers. Some of us celebrate with joy that those prayers have been answered, and then there's some of you that are still in the middle not seeing any progress. And when I think about the patience of God, I think about how he longs to see us come to have life in him. I'm going to call the band up so we can close our morning together. And if you engage in this kind of prayer, a few things I just want to remind you of. It is the spirit and the spirit alone that creates and recreates in our life and in other people's life. And any fruit that we might see from this kind of prayer for other people to come to know and love Jesus is always the result of the fruit of the Spirit and not our effort. Who in your life comes to mind that you want to labor in prayer? Man, I was in the room for Becca giving birth to Owen. It is a long, painful, difficult process. But the joy that comes at the end there are people in our city that need to come to understand that God is patient with them. 